So today, Brian and I would like to speak to you about, I don't like microphones, I'm with Greg on this. I'll just speak loudly. So we're, we'd like to talk to you about nanotechnology in the agriculture and forestry industry, obviously, but we'd like to give a little bit of guidance of how to navigate through the environmental regulations and talk to you about a tool that we're developing at HydroCall. So first, I'd like to give you a rationale as to why the heck are we involved in this? And then I'd like to talk about some applications, which I think I'll gloss over because the earlier speakers were very eloquent and gave a really good introduction into that. And then I'll talk, we'll talk about the next two key components, which is the environmental release and the regulation. So these are two key parts that are involved in our software tools. So that's how those two tie in. And then we'll talk about the actual product itself. Right. So HydroCall, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Golder Associates Limited. We are a group within our parent company. We are a biological testing, consulting, and research lab where we have about 20 people in our actual group, consisting of biologists, microbiologists, ecologists, and ecotoxicologists. So we are CALA accredited to an ISO IEC um, 17025-2005. And what that means is that the methods that we use are very stringently looked at, and how we perform those methods are also very stringently regulated. All right. So these are our key clients that we service, all the way from mining to environmental consultants, so quite the wide range of them. And these are our core competencies. So we work within ecotoxicology and micro and molecular biology. And the tests that we use in these two core competencies are all very high throughput and geared towards industry. So we work with water, sediment, soil, and specialized products testing. And then within the micromolecular group, which is the group that I'm within, um, we offer a bit more of the boutique services. So molecular services, we do DNA testing. Um, our boss says we do paternity testing, but that's not true. <laughs> we do bioremediation services. So we can offer you a bench scale version of what can potentially happen out in the field. And then we also do environmental mi microbiology. Right now we're working on a project on identifying microorganisms that contribute to acid mine drainage. Right? And then more, uh, the other areas that we focus on are more commodities testing. So waterborne pathogen detection and airborne pathogen detection. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, the majority of our work resides in the testing portion, all right? But we also do a lot of research in, a lot of research and a lot of consulting, which really draw on our testing capabilities and also on the capabilities of our parent company, Golder Associates. So why are we involved in nanotechnology? Well, Golder Associates, as I mentioned earlier, we are a ground and environmental engineering company. We're highly involved with environmental impact assessments, environmental effects monitoring. So the potential of nano products entering out into the environment is fairly large. So we need to be cognizant of that. And we also use it for environmental remediation. So we use nanoscale zero valent iron. And then HydroCall itself, we are a testing lab. And we are well known within the environmental community for our testing capabilities and our environmental expertise. And we also have a very strong relationship with Dr. Goss's lab. Um, he talked about a lot of new techniques that are potentially coming down the line. And we're highly tapped into that. And we've also, more importantly, identified that there is a gap. There's a gap in understanding of what's required in terms of testing and regulatory requirements and industry compliance. So we've developed a tool to help navigate through this. And it's also an emerging field. We're a cutting edge company. We're interested in this field. So these are the applications. And like I said earlier, every, other people have spoken about it. So I'll just pass through it. So when you're creating a product, you need to consider it from a life cycle stage, so cradle to grave. So this slide just shows that when you're looking at, at it from nanomaterial synthesis down to product manufacture down to, to the consumer use, there's key things that need to be considered in, in terms of environmental exposure. So attrition, um, disposal, accidental discharge, or intentional deposition of these products into the environment, we need to consider what the occupational hazards are initially. We need to consider what the human hazards and the ecological hazards are. So these are key things that need to be considered. Oh, this actually had animation, but that's OK. So the key parts that we focus on is specifically on the bottom portion of that upper graph. So the ecological impact. We don't do human impact. 
So looking at this graph, the key message is when these particles enter out into the environment, whether they are out in the air component, air compartment, or if they're in the water compartment, or if they enter into the terrestrial compartment, there are potential changes that may happen to these particles. They may bind to organic matter. They may undergo biodegradation, chemical degradation. These are all key things that need to be considered in the whole creation of products of nanotechnology. And this is one of the key por portions of our tool that we're creating. I'll pass it on to Brian, and he'll talk about the next part. Thanks, Sylvia. So um, looking at this complexity, we, uh, I'm struck by two realizations. One is that um, the pathway, exposure pathways for uh, potential nanoparticle exposure to the environment are complex. Uh, and two is just the realization that nanoparticles are going to get into the environment, uh, either through deliberate introduction or through attrition and wear of uh, consumer and industrial products, or through accidental release. And so because of that, there's a mandate on the part of both Environment Canada and Health Canada to ensure that there aren't any uh, detrimental uh, environmental or human health effects from those nanoparticles. Uh, and so, um, as Greg alluded to at the very beginning of the day, if you recall, there are a variety of acts and regulations that apply to nanoparticles. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically about the NSN or the new substances notification regulations, uh, which are the, uh, the general catch-all regulations for chemicals and, and polymers in Canada. Um, and so the idea behind these regulations is that, or the race to get tool for the regulators to uh, gather information and assess uh, chemicals and polymers in terms of developing life cycle risk assessments uh, for assessing potential human and, and environmental effects. Uh, and so um, these regulations apply both to uh, uh, chemicals and, and that are manufactured in Canada, as well as those that are, that are imported or used in Canadian processes. So um, just because somebody isn't manufacturing uh, chemicals, or in this case nanoparticles in Canada, um, doesn't mean that they, they aren't bound by these regulations and, and uh, potential notification. And so the information collected varies from production and use to uh, physical and chemical parameters and a suite of toxicity and ecotoxicity measures. Now, the information requirements vary depending on a variety of factors. Um, first of all, off our production threshold, so how much is produced or used in a given year, um, whether it's chemical or polymer. Uh, the usage, so in particular instances, um, R&D chemicals as well as uh, on-site intermediates are subject to less, uh, less notification requirements. Uh, and also whether the substance is on the domestic substances list, which is essentially the benchmark for whether substance, substance is new to Canada or not. Now, in 2007, uh, Environment Canada issued a uh, program advisory note essentially saying that nanomaterials are, in fact, chemicals, um, which is a shocker. Um, but they also clarified that even if uh, a nano nanomaterial is on the, on the DSL, so on the list of uh, uh, existing chemicals, if it has a unique molecular arrangement or structure, then it is, all, is also considered new. Uh, so the example they gave was carbon-60 or fullerene. Uh, carbon is on the DSL, but fullerene itself wasn't, so it, would be, it was considered a new nanomaterial. Uh, and conversely, those, uh, those that are on the DSL without unique arrangements are, are existing. Um, so because of this, uh, it might seem because of the, the high reduction thresholds and the existence of the DSL that uh, a variety of particles might fall through the cracks or might not be subject to notification. Uh, and that's true unless uh, the regulators use uh, a tool called the SNAC or Significant New Activity Notice. Um, which they can use whenever they suspect that uh, a substance may become toxic in the environment, um, either through increased concentrations, either again through deliberate environmental exposure or through increased presence in, in consumer industrial products, or if the, the mechanism of introduction or ex exposure is different, so exposure to different environmental receptors or different uptake pathways. And again, this is a me mechanism to essentially revisit the, the life cycle assistance they, they perform under the NSNR uh, to revisit, to, in, to just determine whether they have to impose uh, any restrictions on use. So snacks can be issued for both new and existing materials. Um, in the case of existing materials, they, there's also a, a commentary period for industry before any snack notice is issued. Uh, but the important point is that snacks apply to all the manufacturers, importers, and, and users of a particular material, so not just a particular company or a notifier. 
A variety of snacks have already been issued for nano materials. These are some, just some examples. Uh, there's a searchable database on the Environment Canada website if you're interested in, in looking up uh, more. But essentially, a snack defines uh, uses that are either covered by the notice or are excluded from the notice. The additional information requirements, so in the case of nano materials, uh, it's generally uh, size distribution, uh, some extra physical chemical parameters, and it also characterization of the materials as used in the tests. Um, and then timelines as well. Uh, and so within this context, so this is one set of regulations specifically for Canada. There are a variety of regulations in Canada. There are US EPA regulations. There are European REACH regulations. Um, and so what we're developing is we're developing uh, essentially a consulting tool for uh, Hydrocoal, thank you, um, to, uh, to help assist companies in navigating those regulatory hurdles to determine uh, when notification is needed, what information is required, um, potentially where they can find funding if for SMEs if they, if they don't have, uh, aren't able to fund a lot of the, the testing that can be quite expensive as, as Greg alluded to earlier. Uh, and basically be a, a catch-all service so we can, we can find you the testing and, and characterization you need in order to meet regulatory requirements. Um, this is work that's funded by uh, Alberta Innovates Technology Futures NanoWorks, and it is a collaboration with, with Greg Goss's lab. Uh, and we've also received advisory from Environment Canada and Health Canada to, to help contribute to this work. And so essentially, it's a, this, there, there are two parts to this tool. One is a uh, fairly extensive documentation about a variety of um, aspects of nanomaterials and, and regulations. So obviously the regulations, characterization and testing techniques, um, potential funding agencies, uh, links within industry and with academia and uh, governmental organizations to provide a lot of the services that are required. Um, a lot of these aren't available um, at for-profit testing labs uh, yet. Um, and as, and also a software tool where by, um, we link in uh, a lot of these requirements automatically uh, as, well, uh, as well as additional testing. Uh, so te there are a variety of standard tests for additional environmental receptors in addition to what are strictly required by the regulations. And a lot of novel tests, so tests that are being developed at the U of A through, through Greg's lab and through the NMVNI. Um, and as a way of uh, performing due, uh, due diligence testing uh, for, for new nanomaterial products. Um, so the software tool essentially, if a, if, our, if a client were to give us uh, a lot of information about their material, so what it is, its class, its state, what it's going to be used for, how it's going to be applied, if it's, if it's for uh, an environmental application, we can put that in and we can recommend um, characterization, uh, require testing, and additional testing um, in order to satisfy that these, these products aren't toxic. Uh, so currently the tool is NSNR focused. These snapshots are from the very first build we had of it. Um, we switched it to something that's much more extensible but a lot less pretty. Um, uh, but basically, again, uh, a tool to help us to um, make automated decisions um, based on, on both uh, Regu current regulations, um, proposed upcoming regulations, uh, and historical uh, data, and such as the, the previous snack notices. Um, but what we're going, working to do is we're working to incorporate a lot of these additional regulations for um, product-specific uh, sort of applications, as well as the, Europe the U.S. and European regs. Uh, as well as we're constantly looking to uh, expand all of our documentation, so service providers, funding, uh, update the document as tools and techniques come along uh, or are developed uh, and as regulations uh, uh, emerge, we're, we're, we're told that they will emerge but um, the timeline is unclear at this point. So, um, yeah. so with that, basically just to conclude, Hydrocall is a good company to get engaged with at the, at the initial stages of your production. Just because we have the testing expertise, we have our parent company who has the um, environmental monitoring expertise, and we also have very strong connections to the U of A, we have strong connections to the regulators as well. So with that, if you have any quick questions. Thank you both very much. Um, if you're trying to be an innovative organization in Canada, the biggest single barrier to innovation is the regulatory uh, perspective. So we do have time for a quick question. 
And that's a very valuable tool uh, for us. And I'm going to go straight back and tell our VP of Environmental Affairs. Just a question in terms of once you deal with the federal regulation, that's it. Or you have to deal with provincial regulations as well. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of the, the general chemical regulations, uh, it's, as far as I know, it's just federal. It would depend on the specific application you're looking at, whether there were additional um, provincial regulations for uh, specific industries or usages. Okay. 